right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Radledge. I'll be your host for this evening on the Radledge and Broadcasting Network proudly presents Long Road to Ruin. And you might be thinking to yourself, Long Road to Ruin, wasn't that the thing that him and Sean did like years ago that they said they weren't going to do anymore? Uh, you're not wrong. <laughs> we did do that podcast for a while and then we retired it for a bit in favor of doing something a little different, uh, which is where we got on trial from. But this year, being 2019, we decided on the occasion that the subject material should present itself in a way that discussing the entire franchise was more fun than uh, beating up, or not beating up as it were, a single movie. We would uh, dust it off and present it to you. So after a long, brief, depending on how you look at it, hiatus, it's back. And we'll, uh, over the course of the year, we'll go back to it again. We've got uh, Constantine that we're going to look at. Um, no, sorry, sorry, not Constantine. We are looking at that one, but that's not a franchise now, is it? Uh, we're going to be looking at the John Wick franchise later on this year when John Wick uh, Parabellum comes out. Uh, later on, uh, at the end of the year, we've got a Christmas one. I think we're doing the... Um, the Santa Claus, finally, which we meant to do when, during the first iteration of Long Road to Ruin. So uh, we hope you'll be with us, and we hope you enjoy this oldie but a goodie. Tonight on the docket, as it were, uh, is the Hellboy franchise. This week, we reviewed on Damn You Hollywood, myself and Ronnie Adams, re reviewed the reboot of Hellboy. And that gave me the idea to go back and revisit... Uh, I, I think a franchise that many people liked, but uh, but regardless of how well it did, how much people liked it, um, did not d did not bring about any more sequels. More you know more than uh, more than two movies kind of died after that, and then because uh, Del Toro didn't come back, uh, they decided to reboot the thing. It, it has a sort of a weird niche audience, and so. To talk about that and a lot of the other details of this franchise, where it went right, where it went wrong, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. it's my old partner in crime for Long Road to Ruin. Here he is, folks, Mr. Sean Comer. How do you do, sir? Hello, Radulichians. I'm Sean. You're not. You know, when we ended this show last time, I was secretly living out of my car. And now, here we are today... I am a family man. I am back in the fortress, in the brand new fortress of Seanitude here in lovely Kansas City, Missouri. I even have an office that I'm recording out of now. How's that? And, we, and we, even when we used to record this when I wasn't living in my car, I was usually uh, sitting in my living room with my laptop in front of me, in front of the TV. Now I actually have a little dedicated creative space where the magic can happen. And by magic, I mean I'm going to sit here, eat sour gold bears, drink cherry vanilla Coke Zero, and uh, talk about two of my favorite comic movies ever. God damn, this feels good. I am so glad we decided to bring this format back. Yep, we brought everything back but the theme song because, quite frankly, I didn't want to put the effort into uploading a song that was inevitably going to get me a YouTube copyright, copyright strike. Oh, <laughs> in my head, in my head, I have got the Foo Fighters playing on loop. You know, it's funny, the whole week that I've been thinking about this and kind of mentally preparing for this show, I've had the Foo Fighters in my mm. head. Right? <laughs> <laughs> kind of singing it to myself as I walk to my computer, and then I'm like, no, no, I don't. We're not doing this that often that I feel the need to deal with YouTube and upload the song but you know if it if it matters to everybody long road to ruin and in your eyes and go speed like hey all right here we go um <laughs> so all right Sean so we're talking about Hellboy 2004 and then Hellboy 2008 uh the golden uh, golden army the golden shower the golden mm -hmm. circle um hey the, hey you you show some respect to Guillermo del Toro and Ron Perlman. The Golden Army. The Golden Army, yes, sir. All right, I hear you have some notes. Note away, my friend. I do. Uh, you know, originally, creator Mike Mignola had no plans for Hellboy. He was just a character, a big demon with the name Hellboy on his belt buckle that he just kind of sketched on a whim um, at a Comic-Con. But 
circa right circa the early nineties, he started planning on kind of developing his own line of creator owned comics. Uh, he had the stories in mind, but he just needed that, uh, that perfect character. And that was who he ended up turning back to was just this kind of random ass doodle. And he made his very first appearance, albeit not in his own title book in San Diego comic con comics. Number two in August, 1993. Um, Again, how things can change in such a short amount of time. Fast forward to 2011, and he was ranked number 25 on IGN's list of their top 100 comic book heroes of all time. Thanks in no small part to the two movies we are discussing tonight. But before that, before he was a box office sensation, before he experienced this huge surge of... um, popularity in the 2010s that eventually led him in led him to be included in a Mortal Kombat... Uh, no, not Mortal Kombat. Uh, Injustice 2. Yes, he was a downloadable char- character in Injustice 2. Um, he was monumentally successful in Dark Horse comics. Had quite the following. Um, Hellboy is a half-demon originally summoned to Earth to usher in the end of all things on behalf of the Third Reich. However, one thing led to another, and he was ultimately adopted by the Allied forces, raised in the manner of an American human child, and eventually trained as the cornerstone of the International Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense, an agency whose sworn mission is to bump back when things go bump in the night. Um, and you know kind of the most interesting thing about him is in a lot of ways he is just like a lot of other heroes he's a lot like Spider-Man, Wolverine Iron Man, Spawn, Daredevil Batman in that he's haunted by his past he is this in earth years in human years if you will um, about 52 years old he's made 52 trips around Earth's sun and yet, he has about the mentality of an older teen, an elder teenager, or someone in his early twenties. Oh, were we still there? Yeah. Okay, good. We'll edit that part out. Um, but ultimately, despite his, despite his, well, quote unquote, youth, his mentality anyway, he's deeply haunted by the knowledge that. It's his destiny to bring about Ragnarok, Armageddon. Makes him deeply compelling in that he has always got forces pulling him in opposite directions. One toward the life and the race and the sphere of existence that he loves, and the other toward what he was made for. You know, there, there, there's a reason he's known as the right hand of doom. And it isn't just because of that giant whammer on the end of his right arm. So uh, the first movie really doesn't have much of an interesting story as far as its development. It's, it's not necessarily something that was long gestating. It came out in 2004, directed and co-written by Guillermo del Toro, who at the time was, I believe his best known film to date had been, his biggest box office success had been Blade Two, which we have also covered on this show previously. Um, it was, you know, it was an origin story. That's, that's about the most I can say, the most I can say about it. Uh, Mignola was very happy with how it came out. It was visually dazzling it was charming. Ron Perlman, as he typically does, looked like he was having nothing short of the time of his life playing the big guy. And by dollars, its opening weekend um, ultimately made ninety nine point four million worldwide on a sixty six million dollar budget. So it might have been a a thin margin of profit, but a profit nonetheless. To date, it ranks with an 81% on Rotten Tomatoes out of 200 reviews. So, being a bit of a critical darling and being huge among fans, it 
they still decided that a sequel was in order. But here's where we begin the theme of life generally getting in the way of this property moving forward in the intended direction. It was initially slated for a 2006 release, but that got bumped back when Revolution Studios' distribution deal with Columbia Pictures fell through, and Revolution... But this time, it would be co-written between Guillermo between Del Toro and Mike Mignola himself. And they bandied about several original ideas for the script. One was to recreate the classic stories of Wolfman, Dracula, and Frankenstein. Fuck yes, inject that shit straight into my veins. Another was to adapt the almost Colossus arc from the comics featuring Roger the Homunculus. But eventually, what they settled on was a hybridized base story based on various folklore pools to sort of complement Mignola's, at the time, more recent stories that were focusing increasingly on mythology, as opposed to putting Hellboy in kind of a fictionalized historic context, such as, you know allies versus Nazis and oh boy was it resoundingly successful uh, opened up with 35.9 million dollars to top the stop its predecessors opening weekend unfortunately once more circumstance gets in the way plummeted 71% in its second weekend why did it go downhill if it was so apparently popular and it's so beloved today Three little words, kiddos. The Dark Knight. But ultimately, even Batman couldn't, could only slow it down for so long as it made $160.4 million worldwide, did boffo money on home video, and still ranks today with an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes based on 245 reviews. And... Of course, the tail the tail end of it, uh, the very end of the third act, spends a lot of time setting up a sequel. So what exa- so what exactly happened to this curtain call? Fucking everything happened to it. Absolutely goddamn everything. Initially, Del Toro was slated to come back and direct it again, which makes sense, seeing as how Ron Perlman would say off and on throughout the several years it languished in developmental purgatory, that he was the only man who could truly end this end this trilogy on the right note. Unfortunately, for the longest time, Del Toro was set to direct The Hobbit, until he dropped out in 2010. That's got to free him up, you're thinking, right? Right? Well, he hinted in 2012 that the trilogy conclusion was coming, but prophetically, Mignola countered in 2013 that it wasn't really very likely at all, and in fact, vetoed GDT's idea of telling Hellboy 3's story as a comic instead. Year after year, one thing after another continually intervened. First, it was Del Toro's success directing Pacific Rim. Then it then throughout the years it would continue to be the massive budget that GDT's vision reportedly demanded. Perlman certainly wasn't getting it wasn't getting any younger and it was a project with a history of technically making a profit but really nothing impressive. However, if you want to point technically to something that was probably the last nail in the coffin, you can look no further than Pacific Rim Uprising. See, in July 2015, Del Toro said that Legendary Pictures might be willing to fund Hellboy 3 if Pacific Rim Uprising did well at the box office. He said, quote, The hard fact is that the movie's going to need about $120 million, and there's nobody knocking down our doors to give it to us. It's a little beyond Kickstarter. Unfortunately, even that deal fell through when Del Toro bowed out of directing, of directing the Pacific Rim sequel. And finally, in February 17, Del Toro announced via Twitter, must report that 100% print 
Hellboy 3 will not happen. And that pretty much brings us around to today. Eventually, we... Eventually, we didn't get the swan song for the original cast, director, and writers, but circa 2014, Mignola got together with writer Andrew Andrew Crosby and producers to begin to begin gestating a new film. It was originally meant to be a sequel, but Perlman said, oh, "No, Del Toro, I'm out." Neil Marshall jo- Neil Marshall joined up. David Harbour signed on to play to play Big Red. And all of a sudden, it was off to reboot land. On May 8, 2017, Millennium Films announced they were in negotiations with producers Larry Gordon and Lloyd Levin with the working title Hellboy, Rise of the Blood Queen. And Mignola ultimate, ultimately signed on to co-write script with Cosby and, Christ, and Christopher Golden to set up a gritty, proper, R-rated R-rated reboot, which would be distributed by Lionsgate. It tanked. It's tanking miserably. <laughs> and that pretty much brings us about up, right about up to today. So, Mark, take us back to where it all began. Alrighty. Um, with the help of Wikipedia, I'm going to whip through this original... Um plot synopsis for the 2004 Hellboy. So it's 1944, uh, picture it, and uh, with the help of fictional Russian mystic Grigory Rasputin, the Nazis build a dimensional portal off the coast of Scotland and intend to free the Agru Jihad, monstrous entities imprisoned in deep space to aid them in defeating the Allies. Rasputin opens the portal with the aid of his disciples, Ilsa von Hofstein and... Uh, Absturmbanferen Karl Ruprecht Cronin, member of the Thule Society <laughs> and Adolf Hitler's top assassin. An allied team is sent to destroy the portal guided by a young scientist named Trevor Brutenholm, who is well versed in the occult. The German team is killed and the portal is destroyed, and in the process of absorbing Rasputin, while Hopstein and Cronin escape. The allied team discovers that an infant demon with a right hand of stone came through the portal. They dub him Hellboy uh, because they already had a demon and his name was Jeff. Uh, and Brutenholm adopts him. 60 years, 60 years later, FBI agent John Myers is transferred to the Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense, the, it's the BPRD, at the request of Rutenholm, where he meets the adult Hellboy and a psychic amphibious humanoid named Abe Sapien. He learns that a third BPRD member, Liz Sherman, has recently checked into a mental hospital to protect others from her volatile pyrokinetic abilities. She's right next to Jean Grey, who's uh, got dark phoenix powers. <laughs> Despite regular visits and coaxing from Hellboy, she's determined not to return. Cronin and Hopstein resurrect Rasputin in the mountains of Moldova and the three unleash a demon known as Sa- Samuel? 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 Samuel. Sam- Sam- Samuel. Samuel. Got it. So Rasputin and Samuel. Samuel. <laughs> Rasputin and Buse Sam- I am with the power to reincarnate and split his essence causing two of the creature's eggs to hatch and mature each time one dies. Look doc, I'm multiplying. Rasputin visits Liz as she sleeps, activating her powers and almost destroying the hospital, like you do. Myers convinces her to return to the Bureau. Samael's ability to multiply becomes a problem, why wouldn't it, as Hellboy repeatedly kills it, dozens are born. Concluding the eggs are in the sewer, Hellboy, Abe, and several FBI agents go down in the sewer to destroy them. Abe is injured while looking for the eggs, while Cronin kills most of the agents. Cronin, whose mutilated body is run by mechanical parts, shuts himself down, pretending to be defeated. Cronin's body is brought to the Bureau. FBI Director Tom Manning is angered by Hellboy's recklessness. Myers takes Liz out for coffee to talk. Hellboy, jealous, covertly follows them, leaving the Bureau unguarded. Cronin reanimates himself, and Rasputin appears at the Bureau, confronting Professor Brutenholm. Rasputin offers him a vision of the future, showing Hellboy is the, the agent that will destroy the world, a common theme throughout these movies. However, Brutenholm tells Rasputin he will always see Hellboy as his son. 
Rasputin, respecting Brutenholm for raising Hellboy, directs, directs a quick death. Brutenholm is stabbed in the neck by Cronin and dies clutching a rosary. Manning takes over the BPRD and locates Rasputin's mausoleum in an old cemetery outside Moscow, Russia. A team led by Manning Hell- and Hellboy enters the mausoleum but swiftly becomes separated. Hellboy and Manning find their way to Cronin's lair and defeat him. Hellboy reunites with Liz and Myers at Samael's new nest, but the creatures overwhelm them. Liz uses her pyrokinetic powers to incinerate the Samael's and their eggs. Hellboy, Liz, and Myers lose consciousness and are captured by Rasputin and Hopstein. Rasputin sucks Liz's soul out of her body, then tells Hellboy to release the Agru Jihad in return for her soul. Hellboy awakens his true power as Anung Unrama, causing his horns to regrow, and begins to release the Agru Jihad. Myers breaks out of his restraints, subdues Hopstein, and reminds Hellboy that he can defy his destiny, a running theme throughout these movies. Remembering his true mm-hmm. self and what Brutenheim, Brutenholm brought him up to be, Hellboy breaks his horns, reseals the Agru Jihad, and stabs Rasputin with one of his broken horns, like you do. Instead of dying, though, Rasputin is possessed by a creature from the Agru Jihad, the tentacled Behemoth. <laughs> Uh, bursts out a guitar and drums and proceeds to play heavy metal. No, um, it's a joke about Behemoth. <laughs> Behemoth the band. Um, bursts out of his body and grows to immense size, killing him and Hopstein. I was gonna say, how, I was gonna say, how goddamn high did you get to get through this? <laughs> Hellboy, <laughs> Hellboy allows himself to be swallowed by the beast, then detonates a belt of hand grenades and destroys it from the inside. He whispers something in Liz's ear, and she is revived. Ta-da. When she asked how her soul was returned, Hellboy replies that he said, Hey, you on the other side, let her go, because for her, I'll cross over, and then you'll be sorry. Liz and Hellboy share a kiss. Aww. All right. <laughs> um, I saw this initially in its first run in the theater. Um, I don't remember a tremendous amount. This came out in 2004? Really? Oh, uh-huh. uh, yeah. um, okay. You know what I'm thinking of? Um, you said the Dark Knight. That makes more sense. 2008. Never mind. Scratch that. Going yeah. back. 2004. <laughs> um, <laughs> a little confused. Uh, yeah, I saw this in the theaters um, with my buddies. And I remember at the time thinking, like, it was fine. I was never a big fan of the Hellboy comics. I didn't read them. Um, when it came to Dark Horse, I was more into this the, that iteration of Star Wars and the uh, the Alien and Predator comics. I didn't read much of the uh, the non franchise stuff like Hellboy or uh, some of the other Dark Horse favorites. So this was not a familiar character to me. Um, watching the movie, I remember thinking at the time, and then going back and watching it this past week, that you know it, Ron Perlman. Um, it, it was hard for me not to compare him to the new one that I saw over the weekend. Which, uh, I don't want to drag the podcast down by going back over that. If you want to hear mine, myself and Ronnie talk about uh, the differences in the portrayals, go check out uh, this week's Damn You Hollywood. But I will say this. Um, you know, Ron Perlman is more of a like a grizzled, aged Hellboy. You know, a, a wizened Hellboy. A Hellboy who has seen some things. Um, <laughs> what was an interesting portrayal... You know, watching it again this week, um, I mean, look, Ron Perlman's not a bad actor, uh, and certainly Guillermo, I, I think for the, where, where I was, and, and this is where I want you to kind of jump in, Sean, Guillermo hey. del Toro definitely has a style of his own, you know, we, we uh, did a, a on trial for Pan's Labyrinth earlier this year, um, he, he, he has a very, very creative, fairy ish folklore out there style. I would have loved to have seen his iteration of The Hobbit, uh, which apparently caught, would have cost $1.5 zillion to do it his way. <laughs> this is why he's no longer, he was no mm. longer on that project. Um, mm. And so Hellboy definitely had a unique aesthetic. I'm just mm. not sure... I'm just not sure... It's an aesthetic that I particularly uh, find enjoyable to sit through, you know, more than once. 
But I think, but I think you have a different opinion. I think you're really into his artsy style. So let's start, let's start there. Well, okay. Well, uh, let me fire back at you. What what did you not enjoy about his about his particular approach? Um, this is more going to come up when we talk about the Golden Army, but it's too, for the for a material about a demon um, that struggling with its own humanity, its destiny. Uh, you know, for characters that are supposed to be, you know, from a comic book that I've now gone back and read that uh, has, a, has a grit to it, this comes across mm. a little... It, his aesthetic comes across a little Disney to me. Which is weird, because Pan's Labyrinth was anything Disney, but really? Disney. Yeah. Pan's Labyrinth was anything but bright and shiny and soft and cuddly and, you know, and... And, <laughs> and um... Uh, smooth. Okay? Mm. This has a very smooth aesthetic. Like when I look at Hellboy, and I look at the, I look at his makeup and everything. I've come and I, again, I hate doing this, but compared to the new one, the reboot, mm-hmm. it's it's just too smooth. It, it it's an obvious costume. I'm not really taken in by the look. It's it should be more jagged, more devilish looking. More, I just crawled out of hell. Um, Abe Sapien again looks like he should be standing next to Winnie the Pooh, giving my kids hugs and kisses when they walk through the Magic Kingdom. Um, I just it it, it come. I can see where uh, they wanted you know like why they went they went out of their way to do a rated R version this time around because this one what was a PG thirteen. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely seems a little. Restrained, you know. It's like, well, we we can't get too gross, we can't get too gritty, we can't get too ugly. Um, we have to keep it kind of within this little pretty box, and that was off-putting for me. You know, I I get where you're coming from, and let's uh, let, let's start with the justification before I get to my actual opinion. The thing you have to keep in mind about this is we had not had Logan. Logan or Deadpool or Deadpool 2 yet um, those movies had not yet proven that you could make an R-rated movie based on a so debatably well-known comic character and still have it make massive massive box office this was in the relatively speaking early days of the big superhero movie boom we we had gotten X-Men we had gotten Spider-Man um, I believe Spider-Man 2 was was on the way and approaching fairly fast we this was fairly this was fairly early in the game so they weren't really quite willing to take that chance quite yet and go whole hog and especially since gore is costly Uh, you have to keep that in mind Uh, to really do intense gore and violence the the right way uh, that can ratchet up a budget so fast and you would be talking about asking an awful lot of money for what was not a mainline Marvel or DC property. It was a Dark Horse comic. And it was it would have been seen as a huge, huge risk since it wasn't necessarily uh, a character who was as as recognizable as the Hulk. Or Spider Man, or the X Men, or Bat, or Batman, etc., etc., etc. So, I think some of that restraint came out of necessity. But with that being said, I would have loved it if you would have combined so many elements of this movie with a little more of for for what I'm told, I haven't seen it yet for told, the intensity of 
at a quintessential Hellboy. Because for starters, I from what I've seen in the trailers, uh, I I'm already kind of early on still considering Ron Perlman to be the quintessential take on Big Red. Uh, he's just he's got that he's got that swagger about him that that assuredness, but, but with just kind of the right dash of clueless oafishness and the ability to really turn it up when needed. Um, David Hyde Pierce uh, was such a a perfect foil as level-headed Abe Sapien. John Hurt is, you know, uh, John Hurt. <laughs> you, you can't do much. You can't do much better for. doctor himself um uh you know Selma Blair showed up she read lines she 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 went to the business she went to the factory she did a business and everything just sort of came together into this story where uh, these monumentally threatening forces of evil and, and not even necessarily always evil just you know these seemingly otherworldly powers are supposed to exist hidden in plain sight right under humanity's nose and it's just kind of sort of an uneasy disguise of it all and I think that's why you get a lot of the subtlety that comes that comes out of this mm-hmm. is the idea of how can I put this kind of wanting the worlds to seem not too disparate and to almost seem to almost kind of feel believable so you could, sort of couldn't go too uncanny any valley with it because otherwise it kind of would have taken you out of the mindset of the melding of these two realms and that's something that del toro does phenomenally well i mean he even did it incredibly well in blade 2 he did it in pan's labyrinth um you know he's he he's not making striking violent bold strokes with with how he blends reality and fantasy he's a lot of times he's doing his best to kind of be bob ross making his happy little what the fuck trees i think that's where the disconnect is for me if you don't tell me that there's a comic book, and I think it's why I reacted differently the first time I saw it to now since I having read some of the comics, um, mm-hmm. the comic the, the comic begs you to uh, cre- create a movie with with an edge to it, and I and I mm-hmm. hear what you're saying. Look, I don't disagree with your analysis at all. I think in two thousand four, three, two, whenever they started this. Um, clearly not four. <laughs> they, they shot it today. <laughs> um, um, but you know, you know, in the early two thousands, you know, where the thought of making a rated R comic book movie was unfathomable. Um, you, you, you know, you, there's only so much you can do. But then, but then, you know, I, I guess that's the Faustian bargain you make as a creator. Um, like we, you know, hey, uh, Mike Mignola, we want to make your, we want to make your Hellboy into a feature length motion picture. Fantastic. I have all these ideas. Slow down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, know? Um, you, you, you know, you know what I would almost suggest? This is almost a movie that came along about 10 years too late. Um, really? Not 10 years too early, huh? Well, you could look at it either way. You could look at it either 10 years too early or 10 years too late. Because it seems it it seems at times like a movie that if you were to go in the direction you're talking about, the best time to have made it might have actually kind of been in the nineties mm. when 
studios were not shelling out money to make movies about the big boys of the comic world. Right. Um, they, they just weren't able to get, try as they might, they weren't able to get deals done to make Spider-Man and X-Men and what and whatnot. Batman was seemingly the only one that anybody could get greenlit, and those returns diminished damn fast. Um, I was going to say, but, as soon as you said that, I was like, you know what this should have been? This should have been Blade. And when did Blade Well, come? okay. And okay, Blade yeah, comes out in okay. 1998. Okay, yeah, Blade. Um, coming out around the same time as Blade would have been, a, in fact, right off its coattails, would have probably been the best place to put it. Um, and in fact, uh, that's a better idea than what I was going to say. I was going to say that if you look at some of the other comic movies that were getting made in the 90s, um, studios were willing to invest in graphic novels and um, lesser-known books like Tank Girl, mm. Judge Dredd. Uh, well, The Crow was certainly beloved, but let's face it, Superman it wasn't. Um, <laughs> uh, Spawn. Mm. Um, so actually, yeah, that's... Let's, let's narrow this down a little bit further now that you've given me the idea. Uh, don't make it after Spawn because that was the movie that convinced Hollywood for the longest time that an R-rated comic movie couldn't work. Then Blade hits theaters and refresh my memory, Mark. Was Blade rated R? That's what I'm PG-13? looking for now. So keep keep going and I will get an answer for you. Okay. Um, okay. Regardless of what its actual rating was, Blade was still violent. It was intense. It was grim. It was, well, let's face it, everything that people are now saying they they felt all along that Hellboy should have been. Okay, it's rated R. So, okay, so, so okay, there you have it. So forget what I said or what I said earlier because for some reason Blade entirely slipped my mind. Um because then you've got this movie that becomes hugely popular in theaters, hugely popular on home video. You could have followed that up with this, and two things would have happened. Number one, you would have capitalized on that tone and possibly built on it. And number two, DC, because let's see, well, I'm not sure if... I'm not sure if Hellboy was a DC property yet by this time. Um, but in any case, you would have a movie, a, a, a movie from another fairly big, fairly successful comic publisher that was competing with a Marvel character, even if it was one that wasn't marketed as a Marvel character. So that could have made things extremely interesting. But be that as it may, I got to say, for a movie that was trying to toe the fine line between evoke its source material and still remain viable and accessible to the biggest audience possible, I think Del Toro did a damn fine job in... Bring, in bringing this to life even if it wasn't maybe exactly what purists would have favored I think it um, I, I, I've used this term a lot in the past two weeks uh, you know, half pregnant which I got from who knows where but I think as I think about this movie and I mull it over in my mind then look I'm not going to take anything away from anyone who, who appreciates it just as it is you know Mm-hmm. It's, it's a painting. It's hanging on the wall. There's no reason to add a mustache to it. Um, it's fine. I get it. But for me, who has no sentimental attachment to the movie, it is just kind of there. And, you know, I, I, I'm i revisiting it because it, it happens to fit really nicely on my calendar. Um, it just feels like a half-pregnant film compared to its source material. I feel like if you're going to go... If you're going to do it, if you're going to do Hellboy... You go whole hog, and and, mm-hmm. and and again, we're we're we're. I don't want to get into a circular conversation of hey, we just went over this, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I get it. 
on the one hand, Hollywood, you know, made a, a slew of rated R uh, horror esque action movies. You know, Underworld was another one. Uh, you had the Blades. Um, I just had the IMDb page up where it was like, if you like Hellboy, you'll like the rest of this horse shit. Um, <laughs> you know, you brought up The Crow, and The Crow is another really great example of, um, you know, of a comic book that had a real, a real grit, a real uh, aesthetic edge to it. Um, an mm. edgy aesthetic is really what I should have said. Uh, that I feel like Hellboy lacks. And it only gets worse with the second film. Now, I don't want to feel like I'm shitting all over this thing, so let me say a few nice things. Let's do a compliment sandwich. Um, <laughs> and, as because okay. I do, and because I do everything backwards, I just gave you the meat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me say two. Let me give you two two pieces of bread here. I'll say two nice okay, things. Okay, you 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 are making you are making an open face compliment <laughs> sandwich. <laughs> Terrific. Um, <laughs> I think the performances are fine. You know, I think as far as a performance piece for the actors involved, you know, Perlman, you're absolutely right. Some of, some of where showed up, got a paycheck, and walked away. Um, and 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 what's amazing is that she's fucking uh, um, Glenn Close compared to the next one. Oof. Uh, <laughs> but Ron, but the but the boys all did fine. The boys all showed up and worked. Um, Ron Perlman's great. Jeffrey Tambor's Jeffrey Tambor. Um, John, you know, John Hurt's great. I mean, it's a very well acted piece. I think I, uh, Perlman makes the Hellboy character very engaging, very sympathetic. Um, if you don't know that the reboot exists, you don't have any. You don't, you don't have the comparison to make. You know, to the you know played like a teenager. With, you know, who's very angsty uh, portrayal to compare it to. So you know, so. Again, going back to 2004 and examining this, I think his portrayal of a of a wizened, uh, v- you know, vet- veteran demon hunter uh, was a good one. You know, so maybe how it looks is a little too little too smooth, a little too safe, a little too Disney, but it's mm. a well acted piece and it's an engaging enough story. I mean, if you like. You know, if you like the idea of fun-looking monsters killing other monsters, then this is the movie for you. Mm, I would agree. Um, I mean, I the, the the part the part where we disagree is still going to be about the look of the movie because, man, you you complain about it looking a little too Disney. Let let me tell you something. Um, if the live action version of Aladdin had looked had looked this good so far, I wouldn't be so opposed to seeing it. <laughs> this looks this is this is a damn good looking movie. Um, it's too colorful, it's, Sean. It's too colorful. I feel like I'm being blinded by so much color. Don't we? I understand that we live in a world where Zack Snyder has pissed into the camera lens, and now everything is sort of a puke. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, filtered, I did. not you know, everything is grim, dark, and you know, so we're the pendulum has now swung way too far in the other direction. But God damn it, I remember a day where we needed a little darkness in our films. See, again, though, if I really believe that if you were to take um, the the rough edges of the reboot from everything that I've heard, yes, and you were to combine it with just the right lighter aspects of the of the first of the first two movies um in, in particular Ron Perlman's approach approach to the character and you know a a supporting cast you can actually be engaged in and you were to sew those together in just the right strategic places you would truly have a quintessential Hellboy. Yeah, I think what you're saying is the 2004 movie and the and the 2019 movie are kind of two edge, you know, two edges, and we have yet to see something right smack in the middle that you know that marries both visions of this property. And I don't think it's, you're wrong I, about that. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is, I hate to say it, but it comes. But this movie is coming out. The current one is coming out at a time when 
it's competing with a DC movie that absolutely spot on dead center of the bullseye nails its approach to its character and that's Shazam it just gets it um, and and you see and that was an example of a movie where when I where when I saw it it felt like there was just the right like there was just the right balance there was just enough lightheartedness and fun there was action there was a sense of emotional stakes um, in fact uh, after Carrie and I saw it with Alexis last weekend the just as a side note the only thing that I walked out saying was fuck's sake somebody have a word with whoever designed the design the men's costumes okay in that sense I guess you could say that Shazam was kind of to me what Hel- what Hellboy was to you is I I loved most of it except for the fact that <laughs> Darla and Mary's costumes looked looked fine. They looked completely fine. But, and this is going to sound nitpicky as hell, every time you look at one of the men's costumes when they're powered up, it's, it's like people have been stuffed into, two, into oversized shells. You can, like, see. That it, it's, it looks more like body armor. I kept waiting for the balloons to fall out. Magically manifested to from nothing to ideally fit its wearer. It, you can you can see the gaps in the neck where I, there's I, a costume and then there's a, a space <laughs> between that between that and the torso and it just. The, there's no natural muscle movement, and it just. I was gonna say, I, 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 I think it. your connection with, with your connection, you didn't hear me. I said it looked like when they were, just, especially the Asian kid. The Asian kid was the worst because it, it literally looked like if he moved his arms, the balloons were gonna all fly out of his costume. Oh, I I would say it's a real tough race between the Asian kid and Zachary Levi's himself, because <laughs> God damn it. And and my problem with the casting of Zachary Levi from the beginning was the fact that when they finally introduced Black Adam, Graham, you put Zachary Levi on, he is not going to look like he can whip Dwayne Johnson's ass. Nope. He is going to look physically overmatched from the second you put them on screen unless you do the the uh the I guess you could call it the in the reverse the equal but opposite of the camera trick to make it look like Ian McKellen just towered <laughs> over um oh what's his name not Sean Elijah Wood I keep saying they missed what, an opportunity they... to make sh- to make the, the John Cena Shazam it would have been perfect no, no, you're you're actually absolutely right. That that would have been great. And I and I'm a big Zachary Levi fan. But I guess that's my equivalent to you saying that Hellboy looked too smooth and too colorful. Mm-hmm. Is just the the look of them. And that's compared to, you know, the fact that um uh Silvana Silvana and the uh and the Deadly Sins actually look incredible. They look they look fan they look fantastic. The original Shazam, uh, Jaiman Hansu, uh, looks looked great. I love the look of the Rock of Eternity. But then amidst that, you've just got that utter silliness <laughs> um, in in a movie that just hits otherwise all the right notes. So I can kind of see where you're coming from. Uh, I'm gonna give you the final word on this. Is there anything else uh, you want to say? You, you know, you, that you feel like the audience needs to hear from the lips of Sean about this movie? Not really. By all, except that by all means, if you didn't like the reboot, uh, just stop and check this one out if you haven't already. You won't be disappointed. All right, 
Um, moving right along, Footloose and Fancy Free. See, the new the new long road to ruin, we, we, we keep it moving, moving on. Right, right. <laughs> I've learned to rein in my tangents a little bit. Um, during Christmas of 1955, a young Hellboy is told a bedtime story by his adoptive father, Trevor Brutenholm, of an ancient war between the humans and the magical creatures. After the magical creatures are driven back by the humans... The goblin blacksmith extends an offer to Balor, king of the elves, to build him an indestructible mechanical army. Encouraged by his son, Prince Nuada, Balor accepts. The golden army subsequently decimates humanity. Regretting his actions, um, Balor forms a truce with the humans that they will keep to the cities and the magical creatures to the forests. That's, that's a fair trade. Um, they would later sell the forest for a few beads. <clears throat> The crown to command the Golden Army, which can only be worn by one of royal blood, is split into three pieces. Nuwada, disagreeing with the truth, leaves in exile. And he stomps out of scene. In the present, Nuwada returns and begins gathering the pieces of the crown. He collects the first piece from an auction, killing everybody at the site by unleashing the Tooth Fairies. Uh, at which point, Dwayne Johnson comes in with a hockey stick and beats people to death. Um... <laughs> And then kills his father for the second piece. His twin sister, Princess Nuala, escapes with the final piece. Meanwhile, at the BPRD, Hellboy is having issues with his girlfriend, Liz, and dislikes that their organization must operate in secrecy. Investigating the auction slaughter, Hellboy allows himself to be revealed to the world. In the commotion, Abe Sapien discovers Liz is pregnant. She swears him to secrecy. Furious at Hellboy's actions, the Bureau of Superior send the ectoplasmic medium, Johann Kraus, to rein him in. With Kraus in charge, the team tracks the Tooth Fairies to a secret market under the Brooklyn Bridge. Abe finds Nuala has obtained a map leading to the Golden Army and falls in love with her. Hellboy fights and kills Nuala's accomplice, Wink, and an elemental forest god that Nuala summons against him. During the fight, Nuwata questions why he fights for the humans when they have driven the magical creatures into hiding, of which he too is one. Nuwala is taken under the BPRD's protection. Nuwada tracks his sister to the BPRD headquarters using their magical bond, which causes them to share wounds and read each other's thoughts, which gets very uncomfortable when one of them goes out on a date. Da -da 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 -da. Nuwala hides the final yeah. crown. <laughs> Nuwana fights, hides the final crown piece before Nuwata finds her and he battles Hellboy. Nuwata critically wounds Hellboy with his spear and abducts Nuwala, promising her return in exchange for the crown piece. Unable to remove the spear shard in his wound, Liz and Abe decide to take Hellboy to the Goblin Army's location in the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland. Krauss comes along as he sympathizes with Liz, revealing that he too lost his wife in the accident that caused the loss of his own body. They encounter the Beth Mora Goblin, Master Blacksmith, who brings them before the Angel of Death, who is the same fucking creature from Pan's Labyrinth, to retrieve the Spear Shard. The, oh, come on, am I wrong about that? Isn't that the same damn thing? <laughs> the, the warned Hellboy will doom humanity if he lives, an ongoing theme in these movies, and that she will suffer the most from it. Liz pleads for Hellboy's life because women are unreasonable. <clears throat> The angel removes the shard from Hellboy's chest and tells Liz to give him a reason to live. She reveals to Hellboy, finally, that he will be the father. And the audience of Jerry Spring starts to hoot and holler. Um, <laughs> the goblin... <laughs> you are the father. The goblin leads the team to the resting place of the Golden Army, where Nuada awaits them. Abe gives him the last piece of the crown, and Nuada awakens the Golden Army and commands them to kill the team. <laughs> Hellboy challenges Nuwata for the right to command the army as Hellboy is a member of Hell's royal family. Nuwata must accept the challenge. Hellboy defeats Nuwata and spares his life, but Nuwata tries stabbing him. Boo. Nuwala commits suicide to stop her brother. The dying Nuwata tells Hellboy he will have to choose whether humanity or magical means must die. Abe psychically shares his feelings with Nuwala before she dies. Liz melts the crown apart, deactivating the Golden Army. Hellboy, Liz, Abe, and Johan resign from the BPRD, and Hellboy contemplates his future life with Liz 
and their baby. Liz corrects babies, uh, revealing that she is <laughs> pregnant with twins. Okay. <laughs> Why do you like this movie so much? Like, like the other one, if my complaint about the other one is that it lacks grit, it's practically the Dark Knight compared to this one. Oh, doggy. What? What is it? Still, still too bright for you? This is fucking Hellboy Goes to Wonderland. <laughs> but you know what? Somehow that works for me. Okay, fucking better... judge me if fucking judge me if you want to. No, I don't want to um, judge you. I want to. I, I I want I, to. I want to open up your your skull and dig around your brain with a spoon. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. I'm dying to know. Dude. You what? want to, you want to dig you want to dig around my brain with a spoon, Mark? Have you ever finished a bowl of oatmeal and then just run the spoon around the bottom trying to scrape up the last bits of it? Sure. <laughs> I uh, I um, desperately want to know what it is about this movie that tickles your bag so much. Well, what I liked about it is the first one. I got the impression they were trying to do a lot with a little. They weren't given a whole lot of money to make something that was. You could almost call it a almost a pilot project to see if they wanted to go on and make more. And they went the route of telling another Nazi mysticism story, which God knows we've heard a lot of those, and they wove it into a reasonably interesting origin story. I would dare say, in fact, one of the better written origin movies of the comic boom. This one, I like the fact that they expanded the stakes to a world that even Hellboy wouldn't have imagined seemingly could have existed. Um, mythology. Um, uh, invoking, uh, invoking, you know, Balor, who is actually in, in I believe, a uh, Celtic mythology, uh, Irish mythology in general, uh, the Demon King, um, just and just kind of repurposing him as the Elf King. Uh, I I adored it. I would have in fact been just tickled if they would have added even more elements of Irish mythology. Uh, it. It steps up the action. It steps up the. It steps up the scope. I absolutely adored the final fight with um, the the Golden Army and Nuada. Uh, I will. I will say that I think I vastly preferred it when it was in the first movie when it was Doug Jones physically playing Abe Sapiens and an uncredited David Hyde Pierce providing the voice which by the way interesting little tidbit uh, Pierce insisted on not being credited because he felt that the real crux of the performance was was all on Doug Jones I, I've always thought that was kind of kind of admirable of him but Doug handled both the voice acting and and the the physical workload in this one, and God love him. It's just it's it's inferior. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you 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 kind of notice right away that it's different and not different in a good way. Um, Seth MacFarlane as Kraus was a nice touch in that Seth is you know, nobody gives him credit for him. He's quite a brilliant actor. Um, I didn't even realize it was him until I saw the credits. As you've said before, Jeffrey Tambor gonna Jeffrey Tambor <laughs> for what little for what relatively little of the movie he's in. It makes up for the fact that Selma Blair gonna Selma Blair. But I just liked it more. I just liked the idea of him descending even further from kind of just strictly the the little points where this dark mythos is trying to creep up and intersect with humanity 
and into full on possibly becoming a part of what is basically the world of his birth and being this time put to a choice between the two uh, in the first one he was being strong armed into accepting his destiny and in this one you've got one side that is in fact trying to more so persuade him that don't fight me this is this is where you belong you're you're one of our people you're not one of you're not one of them so come and join us but if you're not fair warning we will destroy you if you get in our way it was it was a nice evolution from the first one the the, the whole pregnancy subplot did did nothing for me as did the uh, attempted awkward romance between Abe and Nuala. But just overall, it it shows how much more they were trying to set up, and it, it disappoints me so much that we will never get to see what would have happened in a third movie. Yeah, it's it's amazing how um, nothing went right to get that thing off the ground. Um, you know, between the Hobbit and Pacific Rim, and it's not like you know, and it's not like well, <laughs> we didn't get a Hellboy three, but boy, we got Guillermo del Toro's. Oh, no, we didn't. All right, well, at least that second Pacific Rim. No, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> He has nothing to point to that said, well, at least I got this. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, the first Pacific Rim did fine, obviously, but, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's a shame. Um, yeah, for me, I I don't know. Maybe, maybe I misread the character, but I feel like Hellboy should be cornering loose leprechauns in an alley and gunning them down. You know, I, uh, I <laughs> you know, like, he needs to walk into, like, smoky bars and... Yeah, this this stuff where we're dealing in high fantasy, I don't know. I, I don't know if it suits the character. Um, now you think it does, and you enjoyed it, and, and it's not like I'm not a fan of high fantasy. My favorite my favorite franchise is the Lord of the Rings. Um, mm. I just I look at Hellboy. Like I'm looking at this picture on Wikipedia of the four of them kind of standing uh, across frame. You know, and he's just got he's got a gun. He's got like a six shooter. You know, in a trench coat, and he looks very noir. You know what I mean? Um, mm-hmm. And he's working for, you know, an investigative agency. And you know, and, and next to him is is Selma Blair, who who's doing who's doing her best to look like the chick from Underworld, um, <laughs> Kate, Kate Beckinsale. And it's just you know, I I don't know if high fantasy was the way to go with this. I mean, they certainly thought it, thought it did, and they gave it their best shot. But I would, mm-hmm. I, you know, I would much rather see uh, a bit more mystery. You know, this was an adventure. This this was an, an action adventure with a character who looked like he got whisked out of a noir and thrown into it, and you know, and having to deal with the consequences of his, his new surroundings, which that might work for mm-hmm. some people. It, clearly, it works for you. It didn't really work for me. Um, I mu- I much prefer him. On working a case, you know, I much prefer him to be Johnny Depp in Mexico. I'm just an FBI agent walking my beat. So yeah, I would, I would also watch that movie. I would, yeah, I would, I would watch the hell out of that movie. But for this <laughs> one being, for this one being what we actually got, I still rather loved it. Um. I don't want to belabor the point. I I don't have a whole lot. I mean, a lot, we covered a, we covered a lot of the aesthetic in, uh, interest, you know, in just the overall discussion of both movies. So, um, anything else on this that you feel you know is worth talking about? Not really. Um, I've I, I've really got nothing. I <laughs> when, when you kind of when you kind of compared it to Lord of the Rings, I, I both think it's uh, think it's funny, but I also think it's funny because it's true. Um, 
I don't know. I and now see now you've got me thinking about whether this wouldn't have been better told as a comic arc. I um no, you know what their <laughs> their idea for whatever the third one was, I think uh that was proposed. Yeah, I don't know. This might have worked better as a graphic novel. Um you know, yeah. like, like you think about Lo- you think about Lobo, you know, uh, the DC character mm-hmm. and Clearly, Lobo works with a certain aesthetic and a certain setting, but they've definitely dabbled with Lobo in some sillier places. Um, you, you, you know what I think this might work as, if I'm being mm. perfectly honest? Just an Elseworlds story. Yeah. I think as a one-shot yeah. graphic is... novel, you know, uh, Hellboy yeah. in Wonderland, and be done with it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the Hellboy equivalent to Gotham by Gaslight. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and close the book on this. We have discussed the Hellboy franchise, and we did in less than eight hours. Good for us. Um, <laughs> We've learned in the intervening couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so the next time Sean and I will be getting together... Uh, let's see, what do we got going on in the month of May? Uh, we've got, actually, we're, we're back to on trial on May 16th. Uh, and this was a special request. We do take requests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we Andrew Graham requested that we do the Three Musketeers movie, uh, the one with uh, the late great uh, what's his face there? Uh, oh gosh, help me out, Sean. The late great. I'm trying to think of who in, of who the star in that movie would be dead. Uh, there was Kiefer Sutherland, Oliver Platt, Charlie Sheen, Tim Curry, Rebecca De Mornay. Okay, you know what I'm thinking of? First Night. Uh, Chris O'Donnell, Chris O'Donnell. Yeah, I'm th- I'm wrong movie. I'm th- what's his face who plays the Joker who is now dead was in something else that uh, I'm Heath confused. Ledger. There we are. Uh, you're thinking of Heath Ledger and a Nuts Tale. Okay, so not first night either. Good. Let's start this again. Hi everyone, welcome to Long Road to Ruin. Um. <laughs> oh no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see what year what year movie are we doing here? Is it 1993 or is it 2011? Which year did this come out? Yeah, 93. Three Musketeers. Damn sure it wasn't 2011. <laughs> okay, yes, the Three Musketeers from 1993, as you said, with uh, Charlie Sheen, Kiefer Sutherland, and Chris O'Donnell. Whew. Um that is what we will be doing next. I will be prosecuting. Sean will be defending. The following week, we will be doing yet another Easy long... Easy to defend. I love that movie. Uh, the following week, we will be doing another long road to ruin, another pair of flicks, uh, as I said earlier, for uh, John Wick. I've never, I've never actually seen any of these before, so this will be new to as... me. I'm not the only one! <laughs> Hooray! I finally have no excuse to not, to not sit down. I'm excited. <laughs> so that so uh, we're doing that, and uh, because uh, that same week we'll be doing a damn you Hollywood for John Wick three, uh, Parabellum. In June, we will be doing a pair of on trials back to back, front to front, up and down. Um, Godzilla <laughs> 1998 with Matthew Broderick, and then the following okay. week, uh, X Men three: The Last Stand because that's the same week as Dark Phoenix. As we say goodbye to the Fox iteration of the X Men movies. Uh, in July, uh, nothing. But we kick off August first with an on trial for Pulp Fiction because the same week we will be doing a damn you Hollywood for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood if she could. Um, we will also be doing an on trial for the 1982 iteration of Swamp Thing. Uh, and we'll be doing that because of the Swamp Thing TV series on DC Universe. Uh, all things being equal and landing where they should, that should be August 22nd. In September... In September... We will be uh, breaking... We're going to be doing things a little bit differently. Uh, I will actually just be a judge on that show. And we're going to invite Andrew Graham mm-hmm. in to prosecute 13 hours. Andrew Graham will special guest on that show. 13 hours. Sean will defend it. Andrew Graham will prosecute. Apparently, this is a passion project for him. <laughs> so, 
Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, the following week, unless I'm in, <laughs> unless I'm in uh, Chicago at the time, we will be doing an on trial for the animated feature Gotham by Gaslight in in Chicago. That's awfully specific. Yeah, my wife and I. It's around the time of our uh, of her birthday and our wedding anniversary, so um, we're either gonna go to Epcot or we're gonna go to Chicago. We haven't decided yet. It's all based that on is, money. Uh, that that is the one thing about Lady Jet Bear and I. <coughs> we can we know we don't know exactly when our anniversary is. <laughs> Um, in October, our uh, our creature feature horror feature for the month is Long Road. We're going to be doing a Long Road to Ruin for the From Dust Till Dawn trilogy, and we'll be doing an on trial for Keanu Reeves's Constantine on Halloween. So after we take the kids trick or treating, we're going to uh, saddle up to the computer, light a candle, tell some ghost stories, and put Constantine on trial. The month of November. Uh, Robert Winfrey don't know it yet, but he's in for a surprise because <laughs> we're dedicating an entire week to the Charlie's Angels franchise. Where our part of that is, we'll be doing Charlie's Angels full throttle on trial. Oh. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, 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 uh. Our, as I said earlier, we'll be do, we'll be ending the year with uh, our Christmas show, which is the Santa Claus trilogy, uh, Long Road to Ruin on December tenth. So that's all the my, that's all the Sean and Mark stuff on the calendar this year. Uh, Sean, what do you got going on these days? Uh, well, about the only thing I have got going on right now is well, let's see, uh, pulling up my calendar here. That's not my calendar windows. Thank you. Um, next week, if by the off chance you happen to be in the West Plains, Missouri area, uh, specifically on the weekend of the 26th to the 28th, come find me at OzCon. I will be there with Lady Jet Bear um, manning the Honeysuckle Rose Creations booth on a bit of a nice romantical working vacation for us. And by working vacation, I mean we're going to be also retrieving um, <laughs> some of my stuff to bring back to the house. Um, and the week after that, since one of the things we'll be bringing back is my bigger TV, uh, I am going to be returning to streaming on what I'm going to try to once more make a regular basis. Uh, that starts Friday night at, I'm going to tentatively say, 8 p.m. Central Time. And also 8 p.m. Central Time to 10 p.m. 10 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Um, don't know what I'm going to be playing yet, but hey, after a long social media vacation, I am making my way back over to Twitter. So follow me on Twitter at Comer Codex for updates on when I'm going to be podcasting, uh, what I'm going to be streaming in the near future, any other projects that I happen to come up with. It's just, God, it's good after two years to finally have my feet back on solid ground again. <laughs> it's it's different. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all happy for you, Sean. All right, uh, it's been fun dusting this off. And, you know, again, like I said, we'll uh, we'll hit it up every once in a while where the uh, the opportunity presents itself. I uh, hope you enjoyed listening tonight, and we hope to offend you sometime in the near future.